Welcome to another edition of Anglican Unscripted, episode 521. I'm Kevin Coulson. I'm George Conger. I'm Gavin Ashenden. It's Friday, the 26th of July, 2019. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to another program. You as the viewer have an important responsibility if you have not heard this before. We need you to like the program when you see it on Facebook or YouTube. There's that little up thing that where the guy's got his thumb. You just you click on that. If you don't like the program, you can click on that. We won't judge you. That's fine. We're, we we don't, we want to know you're out there. You need to share the program with your friends or enemies. We're not going to limit who you share it to, of course. But uh, please share this with uh, people you know. And if you could comment. Uh, we have the best commenters on the planet for any theologically news-based show and uh, you keep us uh, on the straight and narrow. We really appreciate that. Finally, you need to subscribe. If you have not subscribed to Anglican Unscripted yet, you go to the YouTube page. You're going to see that little red bar that, said clicks, that says click subscribe. Click on that. And if you want to know instantly the second a new episode comes out, you click that little bell and you'll be all set. Gentlemen, how has your week been going, George? Well, we've been really busy here. We've j I've just started a, an additional service, and I'm going to ask our viewers to give me your advice. Uh, we've started an Anglican Missile service, and I've been using a friend of the show, an Australian priest named David Chislitz. He's got this book with the different mm -hmm. canon of the masses in it. And I'm quite excited because uh, we've had uh, 35 people, new people, at each of these, uh, sh at each of these performances. And we've been using, uh, we tried the 79 uh, Mass, the 28 Mass, and, and I'm just thinking, for those of you who use the Anglican Missal, which canon of uh, the Mass do you really think uh, works best? We, we live in an area where we're the only game in town, so we have to provide services that uh, reach the charismatic and the evangelical, and there's an Anglo-Catholic group that we're seeking to reach out to and encourage and evangelize, and they've asked us to do this, and we have, and it's brought it up. But tell us what you think works um, in your experiences. And you can do that in the comments, or oh, I'm putting George's email right under his name, if you look right there. Uh, he's this way. Uh, that's his email address, and you can send him an email with your suggestions on the Missile for Anglicans. Uh, Gavin has been in the news lately. We're going to talk about that later in the show. Other than the political chaos you're causing, how you been doing? Oh, well, <clears throat> I have two eyes and two legs. So apart <laughs> from being public enemy number one in the Channel Islands and on the Internet, um, I'm very well. Thank you, Kevin. <laughs> oh, no. We keep you in our prayers. I, you know, it's it, it's just another day. It's it's like George Orwell visits Jersey, you know, and uh uh, it'd, be, it'd be a lot of fun to talk about. Before we get to that, though, we need to do some uh, Fletcher story updates. Uh, George, just in case there's people who've not been watching our show for the last uh, month or so, can you give a quick update on the Jonathan Fletcher uh, accusations mm -hmm. and kind of the latest updates? I want, let's try and bring people up to speed who've not uh, clicked on the show in, in a month. I can't believe you guys would do that, but in case you have. George, Here I am smiling, and I know we're going to get some comment. I says, how can you guys smile when you have such dreadful things to talk mm. about? Uh, because we're nut jobs, but <laughs> uh, the noose is tightening. Um, the secular press in the UK is working on this story. One reporter has several victims, and they need just one or two more to help round out this before they break the story. I've been doing... Uh, talking to people uh, professionally as a reporter. Um, we have colleagues and friends who've been talking pastorally to people. The story's getting bigger and bigger and bigger. Now, what story is this? It's actually a wider story of a culture of abuse that is being covered up within conservative evangelical circles and begins with John Smythe and the UN camps, summer camps for boys that uh, have been going on for many decades now, where some of the officers of these camps engaged in sadomasochistic homoerotic practices that have warped young men who are now men our age, who are talking about suicide, 
whose marriages have been destroyed, whose lives are total wrecks because of the abuse that they suffered. One of the accused of abusers, Jonathan Sm John Smythe, died before he could be brought to justice. He fled to Zimbabwe and then South Africa. There's another abuser, former minister of Wimbledon Church, Emmanuel Church in Wimbledon. His name was Jonathan Fletcher. This all allegations at this stage. And we've been talking to people. We've also under, we've also found heroes, people within this movement, within this group, have been fighting to cleanse the church. A lot is happening, and it. How should I put this? This is a soul sickening story. It's a, it's on par with if you're a Roman Catholic, it's on par with the Cardinal McCarrick hmm. uh, story of a person in high church office, a person who is a leader, a person who models Christ for people, has a double life that involves abuse and destruction. And it's going to hit the Church of England soon. There was an article in, I think it was the Church Times, where the insurance company for the Church of England says, hey, it would be really nice if we weren't pastoring to these people, these victims, because it looks bad. And if we end up before a court and we're actually saying to these victims, oh, it's, you know, it's horrible what happened to you. Well, you're admitting guilt. And as your insurance company, we recommend you do not admit guilt. What's that story, Gavin? Well, you've described it very neatly. Kevin, the Church of England is insured. It's insured by a company called the Ecclesiastical Insurance Group. And whenever there are meetings, at least certainly in the past, whenever there have been meetings to discuss abuse, one of their representatives is there. Uh, in, indeed, a woman lawyer who represented them gained the reputation of being the pit bull because she behaved so aggressively towards victims as well as members of the Church of England. But in this particular case, the ICSA inquiry, uh, this is the, in the independent inquiry into child sexual abuse, has uncovered some of the correspondence that this ecclesiastical insurance group have been sending out. And published in the Church Times today is a letter from them, very carefully poised. We're dealing with sophisticated business people who, who don't act clumsily. But essentially, warning the Bishop of Birmingham, who was reaching out to a man called Julian Whiting, who'd been abused twice, once by an employee at Lambeth Palace, who was not a clergyman, and once at a school in Birmingham, um, where the Bishop of Birmingham was uh, the president of the governing council. And the insurance group essentially said, um, we're not telling the bishop not to care. Of course we're not. Uh, we're just saying that he must be extremely careful how in the number of times he meets Julian Whiting and what he says because there's a great danger he'll extend our liability. Now the church times go uh, make a strong point of saying that the Bishop of Birmingham paid no attention to them and wouldn't have done but what it has done is expose a climate of restraint uh, and a, a very serious moral pressure on the Church of England to behave like a callous pragmatic institution now whether or not the bishop of birmingham admits or uh, has or hasn't withdrawn any pastoral support julian whiting himself says he's been waiting 17 years for some kind of help and his experience of the institution of the church of england is like being re-abused again so we're still in a position where as an institution the church hasn't been able to free kind of ineptitude that we saw in the way in which the Archbishop of York was handling things uh, and in the compromise it feels uh, given the pressures that its insurance company uh, and the inst and institutional as a whole weighs down upon it with. Well, Jillian's testimony is not unique. We talked a week or two, we briefly mentioned last week or the two weeks ago, a gentleman named Matthew who gave testimony uh, against Justin Welby and others that said, Matthew Innocent. Yeah, who said, Listen, I've come to you. I complained about what's going on. I gave you example after example, and you, you locked me out of the church. You banned me from your church. Tell me a little bit about Matthew's story again. And if I could inter interject, mm -hmm. Matthew, in a, at this most recent ICSA hearing, Justin Welby was asked, Had he apologized? And he 
pulled out a letter from the file saying, yes, here's the letter from the file saying, uh, couched, you know, on a conditional, if you were abused, we feel very badly for you and this and that. And Matthew Innocent uh, turned around and said, "After you know, this is a lie. Nobody has apologized to me. The apologies are pieces of paper stuck in the file to prevent legal... I'm assuming now that these apologies, if they are made, are made at the direction of the ecclesiastical insurance company to have something in the file to show you exercise due diligence, not well, please, pastoral and, support and love. And please backdate it. <laughs> well, yes. there are a number of people who have who are, who are, who are done a really wonderful job. Um, a number of victims who constantly speak out. Uh, Martin Sewell, who, is a, who writes a Cranmer's blog, uh, writes incisive direct moral challenges to the church. Uh, we saw a general synod uh, in, in York only a month ago, uh, a very sophisticated presentation put up, a new director of safeguarding, a woman who was a, a, an MP and had a long experience in social work. But in the end, I think the only thing that will convince any of us that the moral duty is being done is when the victim themselves say we believe we've been listened to and we believe we've been helped in ways that get us beyond where we are at the moment they're not saying that and the difficulty is that this isn't just historic so it's julian whiting in 2010 with the influence of the ecclesiastical insurance group uh, it's the it's it's the complete incompetence of the Archbishop of York who claims that, that floods have carried away files he's had and he knows nothing about what's going on it's the incompetence the Archbishop of Canterbury that Matthew Innocent calls a hypocrite to his face because he's saying one thing in public and doing behaving in an entirely different way and now we find that uh, under the uh, in the evangelical subculture of Emmanuel Wimbledon the same thing is happening it's it's almost that people cannot we might be talking later on in the show about what people can and can't hear, but it's almost that people cannot hear how important it is to tell the truth, to deal with it, to, to, to care for those who are wounded uh, and to repent. So, I mean, how often do you have to say this before people hear it? They have yet to hear it. Well, I, George, let's, let's do a full stop here. The full stop is we're Christians. We know as Christians, God can redeem this that this is a fully redeemable situation like many others before it. And there's gotta be some good news coming at, at, in some places, George, in this story. No, I don't think so. No? Uh, not that I've seen. <laughs> uh, because, because we're dealing with culture. We're not dealing we with are. people anymore. We, yeah. it, uh, there's a wonderful Kirk Douglas movie called Pass of Glory, where Kirk Douglas plays a French colonel in the First World War and his troops try to storm a German redoubt, and they're rebuffed. And the local general orders three men to be taken from the regiments by lot and shot uh, for cowardice as an example to others. And the movie is Kirk Douglas fighting for his men and the generals uh, looking to save the reputation of the French army and so on and so forth. And it's a devastating anti-war movie that was actually banned in France for about 30 years. This is how the Church of England is acting. They have executed the late George Bell to encourage others. Uh, that George Bell has been handed, a, uh, handed an unjust sentence of, of uh, abusing uh, children that is nonsensical in every rational sense. And the Church of England points to this is how they're acting against abusers, someone who died 40, 50 years ago. When in the reality, it's the generals at the headquarters, it's the bishops in the palaces, who are seeking to preserve their reputations, their authority, their power, and are allowing cover-ups to take place. The It is an us versus them situation uh, of the hierarchy, the establishment versus the people. And it's just, I don't see any good coming out. There are individual good acts. Gavin has cited them. Kevin, you have cited individuals and groups and people across the theological spectrum. This is not a left-right issue by any means. But until the institution is prevent, is changed, and until they shoot one of the generals, not just a private for cowardice, I don't see any real change taking place. 
And I yeah. think this actually goes to the heart of what we understand the gospel to be without without being too simplistic. In one sense, the highly commendable and very dedicated religious Pharisees in the New Testament are often presented as an example of people for whom the system and the integrity of the system came for their capacity to see, to exercise compassion and to see the, the woundedness and the vulnerability of, of holy love in practice. And this is no longer about um, pharisaical standards but it is the same thing it's about ego public reputations the tribe the system you believe in it happens to be the church now rather than temple judaism but i think it's a warning to us all that um our, our vulnerability this this is what ought to save us from Pela the pelagianism that is so so crippling the church uh, that our vulnerability to, to pride and to self-defense is perpetual and, and only with the greatest uh, of scrutiny can we save ourselves um, and as yet we haven't had to defend Anglican unscripted as an institution or as a program but I dare say if we ever had to we, we might find ourselves you know uh, in some kind of moral dilemma there is a real moral dilemma and the problem is that the people who are responsible for the church today are falling the wrong side of the spiritual and the moral line but the hope is that by listening to the gospel, by hearing words charged, hopefully with some kind of prophetic spirit, they might hear and change. And again, one of the reasons why we've been making so much of the Fletcher scenario is because if some of the people who were wounded can find the courage to speak out so that accountability can be held, then along with that accountability comes transparency and a chance to learn lessons and change the culture. I don't mean learn lessons in the sense of education, which is the way in which the spokesmen of the institution always speak about it, that dreadful phrase, lessons will be learned. I mean genuinely learn from the crisis, the human crisis that we all face when ego and reputation of the club we belong to gets in the way of the, the, the real moral duty that wounded people present us with. If I, I'm going to shock some of our viewers by saying the Episcopal Church has done a good job in this area and the Church of England could learn from it. Charles Benison uh, was probably oh, wow. the worst Episcopal Sorry. Bishop of my generation, and he had plenty of competition for that honor. He was deposed, not for denying, uh, not for it. Charles Benison wrote an Easter letter one year <laughs> saying that uh, Jesus is a sinner just like you and me. Uh, Charles Benison had plenty of theological and financial and other reasons for being deposed. He was finally deposed for his involvement in a sexual abuse cover-up. 25 years earlier, when he was a priest in California and his brother was a youth minister, he walked in on his brother having uh, sexual relations uh, with a teenage girl. And Benison opened the door, closed the door, and uh, I saw nothing. Uh, his brother went on to be ordained as a priest and eventually was kicked out of the priesthood when this was revealed and Benison cooperated with everything. But 30 odd years later, when it was finally brought to trial, Benison was dismissed for failure to act in, in a clear case of abuse. Now, let me put this into, stand, into uh, context. If Johnson Tamu were an Episcopal bishop, and the standards applied to Charles Benison were applied. John Santamo, in his actions in the innocent case of what I know that has been made public in the ICSA hearings, would be deposed on the same level that Charles Benison is deposed. The Episcopal Church, um, I think, may, may, it may, is a, because of our experience with the Catholic abuse crisis in the United States, that's been going on for 25 years now, um, there's no gray area here. The, the debate whether or not there should be an independent uh, authority or somebody outside the bishops and the church looking at abuse, it's not an issue in the United States for anybody. Yet the Church of England still still seeks to, uh, to hold tight on this authority. Um, Gavin, you mentioned a uh, report that was in private eye. Folks, we're at the point where the Church of England news is really coming out in private eye. But private eye had a story where the church, the dioceses were asked to uh, do these reviews and evaluations, and a third of them, a quarter of them, did such a poor job they had to be redone. Um, this is incredible that in this day and age, the Church of England is so anti-truth, anti-victim, pro-pro-establishment. Oh, 
it's just incredible. I wonder how many comments your your uh, suggestion that the Episcopal Church does it better is going to get in our comment section, which we look forward to. Uh, it, and that, well, that, let me that, just that, let me well, broaden it by saying the American uh, experience. Um, um, you you have to the Episcopal Church does do some things very well, and this is one of those areas. There is no, I mean, I've had you know I I've in in this current parish I've had two. One current, one historical allegations of a, phys a sexual abuse brought to my attention. There was no question whatsoever what I did. That say, as soon as I got out of that meeting with those persons, I memorialized it in writing. I contacted the diocese. I contacted the insurance company in New York City. I contacted the children, uh, father, family, and children's services. I mean, forget this. Well, let's file it, and it's you know the. Tr uh, Justin Welby's argument. Well, I thought somebody else was going to look into it. It's the Bishop of Ely's job. Yeah. If I had actual, if I had knowledge, not first-hand knowledge, but if I was aware of it, I knew exactly what to do. And this didn't happen yesterday. This has been the standard for years. Oh. If we were telling Since this in parabolic, if we were telling this in parabolic form, uh, it would, the, the parable would be called the instead of the Good Samaritan, the Good Episcopal Church. <laughs> the normal, the normal enemy behaves properly and well, sets an example to everybody. No, but no, you, right, right, well, hold on, right now. If, 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 you, if you're unable to call out success and people with whom you disagree on other issues, then you have no business offering comments because otherwise you're just an old crank. Well, but you I, have to cite what is good in when you see it, no matter uh, the source of that goodness. I, I agree. Otherwise, but I, right you're just now our, people's time. Our old cranks are going, well, what about right or what about spawn? And that's a different topic. That's that's theology that was not dealing with sexual victims. And I, I agree with George on this, that the Episcopal Church uh, does this part well. Let's uh, move on quickly. We've, we've really gone over on our Fletcher, which is fine. Uh, we, we hope that uh, we can glorify God with that story at the end of the day, that people will be encouraged. However, somebody set off a gay bomb in Jersey. Now, you guys know that both Newark, George... Uh, uh, Bayonne, <laughs> uh, Trenton, uh, which part of Jersey was this? <laughs> Gavin will tell us in a minute. But you guys know that George is very elegant in his words, and so is Gavin. They're great speakers. They're both great writers as well. And Gavin is actually paid by a newspaper in Jersey to write articles um, from time to time. And his latest article has what we call stormed the Twitterverse, has arced the Earl of the gay activists, the LGBTQ2ZYBs people. And I thought we could talk about that because uh, George Orwell has visited, visited Jersey and said hi to Gavin. Tell us a little bit about your story. Well, the articles were unpaid for the first four of the six years, but when I left Jersey I and had to pay my, my a greater proportion of my bills, I, I invited them to, to, to pay a small amount of money, which they did, which was very helpful. Mm -hmm. It looks like it's now come to an end. Um, the, about six years ago, I was asked by the editor of the newspaper if I would write a daily column. What they were looking for was somebody to the right of centre who could... Uh, offer some sort of cultural balance to the, to the move to the left. And the editor was a good, is a good progressive intellectual. And uh, it was really a, a very wise move of his to do it. They tried me out and people liked what I wrote, so they kept me going for a while. And what I've done is, is I've been writing about free speech and freedom of conscience. Uh, and sometimes everyone knows I'm a Christian. Uh, they, they know what I, what I, how I spend my time. Um, and I, I try and slip the Christian values in, some, sometimes explicitly, but mainly implicitly, in order not to give people too much indigestion. It's worked quite well. I knew the end would come. I kept on saying to the, um, you know, there will be a point when you can't publish me anymore because the situation is getting worse day by day. Well, I never quite knew when it was going to happen, but and, uh, last week I wrote an article about an English doctor who refused in a hypothetical inter in, in an interview about a hypothetical case to uh, to succumb to to cultural dogma and use personal pronouns of a hypothetical person he had to meet. But in the course of this, I, I, I put a single sentence in which said, "We know that children raised in traditional marriages fare better." than children raised outside them. This set a nuclear bomb off. Uh, 
I, I think the editor underestimates the level of campaigning that the left wing do. Um, but he panicked and got very upset. And, and he then Googled uh, parenting and parent parenting outcomes and wrote to me saying, you know, Gavin, you haven't done your, your job properly because I can find 60 progressive papers that say gay children in gay families do wonderfully and really only one or two that says they don't so the weight of evidence is against you you know you have a, you have brought me shame for saying something is true and not backing it up so i then said to him well the reason i i wrote that sentence was actually because i read a very interesting book in the last 18 months called same-sex parenting research by an american called walter shum mm. uh, and uh, Walter says three things. He says that lesbian relationships are the most fragile there are. Male homosexual relationships are the most uh, per permissive there are. And um, it's a no-brainer that children need men and women in their domestic environment to help them understand and negotiate their own sense of gender identity. And finally of all, uh, even though gay p parenting in gay circumstances has been going on in Scandinavia, certainly about 30 years, there isn't really the length of time for the progressive lobby to prove that the long-term outcome of children raised outside traditional parenting actually is, is virtuous. So at a, at, a, at, a, at a sociological and an intellectual and an analytical level, it's really a no-brainer. But in universities, you can't do research saying that children come out best in traditional circumstances because you get fired. Nigel Bigger at the University of Oxford gets fired for even mentioning the word colonialism. A, a man called Carl Noah at Cambridge gets fired for even going, attending a conference where they're asking the question about race and intelligence. So the fact that on Google, whose algorithms are never quite straightforward, you find that the weight of evidence is not even doesn't mean that's where the truth lies. Well, I suggested this to the editor. Uh, and, you know, we've heard of Boris derangement syndrome, Trump derangement syndrome, Brexit derangement syndrome. What happens is there seem to be elements of um, cultural, theological, psychological, spiritual conflict. And instead of being able to think through them quite clearly, allowing evidence to be heard on both sides and to you know, stumble in a Hegelian way towards a, a synthesis that might be near a conclusion, people just blow up. And, and the emotional nuclear explosion means that, that conversation, uh, the whole empirical enlightenment progress of finding, process of finding truth doesn't work. So what, what then happens, of course, is then the whole subject gets closed down. So um, it looks like I'm on permanent pause as a columnist. <laughs> and and, and I've, I've, I said to him, to the editor, look, I'm going to write to two people. I'm going to write to the editor of a, of a newspaper who's got certain priorities. I quite understand you dispensing with, with my writing. You're absolutely entitled to do that. But let me write to the human being behind the editor who knows that there is a cultural crisis for freedom and for truth. Are you really willing to have the battle lost where you are now forever, because that's what you're deciding. I think the left has discovered how to win the argument, and that's to never have the argument. But you know, using Twitter, using social media, they've learned that the loudest voice that lasts the longest always wins. And that's just what they've done now for the last eight to 10 years, is they've just put together this whole bomb of loudness. How well, and not, and not, and not just that, but 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 also the thing that I find most difficult uh, uh, in um, the day after Boris uh, uh, had such an exciting time in Parliament, many of the left-wing critics, instead of taking to pieces his words, are listing his his demerits and and his and his cabinet, his politicians. Also, they're saying, you know, they may be from minority immigrant communities and modeling diversity well, but they're all third class, which sounds to me <laughs> <laughs> really it's in the, in the time, stroking the out time here. Today. Did they say that? No, they really did. It, it, Phil Collins in the Times opinion paper today said that. And what I found in Jersey was on the on the uh, on one of the websites where they were discussing me. Uh, they were saying, you know, this man Ashenden is a piece of 
S H something T. He's he's a he's a nasty, bigoted, narrow-minded person who is utterly homophobic and should never be published anywhere at any time. I won't I won't bother. But I read this. I thought, wow, wow. Uh, where do they say? Where do they show I was wrong? Where do they say that anything I said is, is and and not once? It's all ad hominem. So I think there's, there's a psychological, a cultural. Uh, uh, but also a spiritual battle here. And the re although George was sweet enough to say that he thinks that, that, that some major politicians have found their way around it, I think at ground grass level, it's very difficult indeed for us to keep open a conversation which has, which has fact and value accessible at the heart of it. If, if I may jump in and say I experienced something, though not as exciting, uh, it, Gavin has been martyred at the stake of press freedom and intellectual freedom. Uh, I was martyred for a much smaller, less glamorous cause. Uh, I, was a, I was a correspondent for the Living Church magazine for six, seven years. And in 2009, the editor retired, David Calvillage, and they had a, a new editor, Christopher Wells. And I had wrote, I wrote, three, four, five articles a week, and it was the principal source of my income along with my parochial work, parish work. And the new editor made a decision to get closer to the Episcopal Church, and he actually ran for executive council. And it's a little difficult to run for executive council and be an insider in the Episcopal Church when your news uh, editor, Steve Waring, and their ace reporter, George Conger, were uncovering all these scandals about... Uh, it's Jeffrey Shorey and all this and that. So I was never actually fired, but they just, you know, declined to publish any articles I sent them anymore. Now, it makes perfect sense for the Living Church to decide their future does not lie with the conservative movement, doesn't lie with ACNA, doesn't lie. It lies by being a loyal opposition within the Episcopal Church. The Jersey Evening Post is not there to publish truth. It's there to sell advertising. And if a gay group decides to pressure advertisers to withdraw advertising, there goes Gavin Ashenden. Um, Do you know, George, I think the thing, the thing that's upset me most, I think, as I've been thinking about it and, and getting upset, um, uh, and not being very impressed with my own lack of moral caliber as I've been upset, but, but there are, there's quite a group of Christians in New Jersey still. There are more Christians than there are gay people. Um, it, it, would be a good, it would have been a good thing if throughout the churches, the Christian community could have said, well, although this man doesn't speak for us specifically, nonetheless, we ally ourselves with the values that publishing this column represents, and we want both sides. But as far as I can tell, the Christian voice socially and culturally has been completely silent. And I think that, forgetting me for a moment, I think, I think that's where the tragedy lies across our culture. Uh, in terms of the whole progressive war on the Judeo-Christian tradition and on the family, whether it's abortion or gay parenting or, uh, or the absence of sexual uh, moral boundaries, Christians have simply rolled over and, and, be, and on a whole been silent. And, and I, I wonder if uh, there's going to come a point in judgment when, when our, our Lord holds his church to account for that. Well, Gavin, I think I, can, I cannot answer the macro question, I can only speak to the micro, and that is to provide alternative, alternative views through alternative sources. I was the chief correspondent for the Living Church, simultaneously being the chief correspondent for the Church of England newspaper for almost 20 years. I left both of those positions, gracefully let go by the Living Church, and they just stopped paying me at the Church of England newspaper. <laughs> Um, because they made different editorial decisions. And Ke and then this man came along named Kevin Carlson, who has a computer company, who said, well, why don't we do this? And the upshot is we Anglican Inc. has a larger Internet presence than the Church of England newspaper, which has been around since 1828, and the Living Church magazine. In other words... They both... That's immodest to me, but, you know... Yeah. If you have a, if you have something that is that people wish to use and see and take part in, they will do it. You just have to find a way to deliver it, and you are doing it. Your voice. I hate to be unkind, but you know the Jersey Evening Post may be read by eighty thousand people in Jersey, but your voice is heard around the world. 
Well, this is where we ask Kevin to say share, subscribe. <laughs> yeah, well, a couple of things. First, Living Church left an, a wonderful vacuum for us to fill. Church of England News left a wonderful vacuum. It was just, all we had to do was you know, print Orthodox news in the Anglican fashion, and boom, we, we became the, def, the default news source for Anglicanism at the, the absolute upset of the Church of England, at the absolute upset of the Living Church. How, how dare they? How dare somebody just start posting real articles when we were the news source? I'm sorry, you left a, a vacuum. What a great transition into raising money. Whoa. So we have places to go and things to do next year in the years to come. We want to start raising money to go to Lambeth. Not raising money this week. I'm asking you to find your checkbooks. So next week when we start raising money, your checkbook will be right there on your desk and you can write out a one with lots of zeros or two with lots of zeros on it and send it in to us. Uh, use PayPal, whatever. But right now, because our friend Gavin is losing his little paycheck no, from no, that no, little... No, 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 no. No, 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 uh, Gavin and, and not force him to take money if he doesn't want it. Well, uh, see, I'm an that, evangelical and I never honor bishops. Right, I mean, they, they give kindly advice, but they're far away. Oh. So, friends, <laughs> hang on. Let's, have a, no. let's, compromise. let's compromise. If the Lord speaks to you in the middle of the night and tells you to do something, do it. Yeah. But then let's leave it there. Uh, his PayPal address <laughs> is in the comments, just ironically, coincidentally, if you so feel led by the Lord in what you do uh, to, to, to help out a, a bishop. So let's close out there. A great show, guys. Wonderful topics. Uh, we got to talk about George Orwell and Jonathan Fletcher in the same episode. No coincidence there. I'm Kevin Coulson. I'm George Conger. I'm Gavin and You've been listening to episode 521 of Anglican Unscripted Living Church, Church of the Newspaper. Eat your heart out.